Good, af good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're listening from. Uh, I'm David Gantz, the Will Clayton Fellow for Trade and International Economics at the Baker Institute. Uh, I'm also an emeritus law professor at the University of Arizona. Uh, very pleased to welcome uh, all of you on behalf of the Center for the U.S. and Mexico at Baker at Rice. Uh, this is the first of our five planned uh, uh, webinars on the implementation of the United States-Mexico Trade Agreement, USMCA, which as everybody knows, entered into force almost exactly two months ago on July 1. Um, just a quick plug for the other events, uh, September 24th is gonna focus on investor protection and investor state dispute settlement or the lack of same. Um, the next in October, the USMCA provisions governing trade in autos and auto parts. This account, this sector accounts for about 25 plus percentage points of total manufacturing trade within North America. Uh, then in November, we're gonna move to talk about some of the new environmental uh, provisions. And finally, in December, we're going to shift gears a little bit and focus on some of the stakeholder issues. The companies that are directly involved in importing and exporting across the North American borders uh, who are dealing with the new and new enforcement provisions, uh, a different kind of, uh, of certificate of origin and other, uh, other challenges um, uh, in the customs area, the nitty gritty that really determines whether trade uh, is going to work or not. Uh, all of these webinars are free. You'll get notices periodically and you do need to register to get on Big Marker. Uh, we thought it would be appropriate to begin this series with the discussion of context. Uh, you have the USMCA. It was negotiated back in the late summer and fall of 2018. It was signed November 30th, 2018, but it didn't really move forward until fall of the last year, uh, mostly October, November, and particularly December, um, where it was modified through a series of what from the outside appeared to be extremely difficult negotiations between the Ways and Means Committee, uh, members, uh, two of whom are here today, led by Chairman Neal and Speaker Pelosi uh, as well, and the administration, principally the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, uh, headed by Robert Lighthizer and the Treasury Department's Stephen Mnuchin. Uh, we, were for we were fortunate in getting uh, and in convincing uh, two uh, significant members, senior members of the Ways and Means Committee to join us today uh, for this discussion. Uh, some of the factors that led to approval of the USMCA in December by the House and uh, January by the Senate by historically large margins, 385 to 41 in the House, 89 to 10 in the Senate. Uh, these uh, members of the committees are going to share their observations. Uh, keep in mind, for those of you who don't follow these issues as closely as others, Ways and Means is, at least in my view, the, by, by far and away, the most important uh, committee in the House. It's not only responsible for trade and uh, tax and tariff policy, but also for tax, Social Security, Medicare, welfare, and related legislation. In other words, what Ways and Means does affects all of us every day. Um, so um, we're going to start with Kevin Brady, a Republican from the 8th District of Texas. He's the ranking uh, Republican member of the Ways and Means Committee. Before his service in Congress, he was an executive for the Chamber of Commerce and also served in the Texas House of Representatives. He is a person of very broad interests, uh, in addition to trade agreements and trade and tax legislation, healthcare, small business, uh, chair of the health subcommittee. He's been working very hard, I think, over the years to try to improve American healthcare without increasing the costs. And he's been a key participant in uh, bilateral efforts over the year to deliver effective disaster relief for uh, communities affected by hurricanes like Harvey and Maria and uh, Irma. Uh, Congressman Beyer, Democrat in the 8th District of Virginia, that's Northern Virginia, very close to Washington, um, is completing his third terms in the, ho in the House in the past, he's had a number of other uh, important posts. He was the U.S. ambassador to Swiss Switzerland and Liechtenstein for a period uh, and also served as lieutenant governor of Virginia. Um, he has also very 
uh, broad interests, climate change, individuals with disabilities and those on welfare, programs designed to discourage high school dropouts and to discourage teenage, uh, uh, teenage pregnancy and a series of pro-business reforms in the state of Virginia. Um, also, I think quite important for many, uh, it's, uh, he was a uh, uh, very strong uh, assistant and pro a proponent in Switzerland during that period, uh, working with the US Justice Department to try to halt the abuse of Swiss bank secrecy by Americans who were uh, trying to shield their income from US taxation. So again, here we have two experts and we've asked both of them to speak for 12, 15 minutes each, giving us their observations uh, and, uh, and any other uh, gloss that might help us understand this process. Um, I've asked Congressman Brady to speak first and then he will turn our virtual podium over to Congressman Beyer. Once Congressman Beyer has completed his remarks, uh, I'll use my prerogative as the moderator to ask a few questions. Um, those of you in the audience that have questions, please use Big Marker's Q&A function. Uh, it would be helpful if you could keep your questions short and also germane to our subject matter. Uh, and I will try to have as many of those answered by our um, esteemed colleagues here as possible. So um, Chairman Brady, it's your floor. Dr. Gans, thank you very much for having me uh, here today. Thanks for your uh, leadership at the Baker Institute at Rice. We're really, our region, our state really, I think on a many policy issues, our country's uh, really fortunate to have you in that role. So thank you for that. Um, it has been uh, almost two years to the week since you had me to the Baker Institute to talk about the prospects of USMCA. Uh, and I'm glad to come back to talk about the context and dynamics of it. Especially proud to be joining Representative Don Beyer, who uh, is a friend, uh, who is, um, while relatively new to the committee in ways and means, you wouldn't know it because he brings his business expertise, uh, digging into policy issues, working hard to find common ground. So Don, it is really an honor to, to be here with you today on an issue that affects so many working Americans. So thank you for that. You know, we live in a, in a world where I think uh, there is so much where people try to divide us. Um, and I'm one of those who believes there is so much more that unites us than divides us, both in America and in Congress as well. Um, trade, turns out, and the USMCA uh, has turned out to be a historic moment uh, in the midst of impeachment where members of Congress and the administration put their differences aside and achieved something I think very important for the American people. Dr. Gantz, you asked us to talk about the context and the dynamics of this, um, which uh, will be followed by a series of, of seminars or webinars dealing with the specifics. So let's let's talk a little about those these dynamics. And I'll give you my view from having worked on 13 of the 15 trade agreements that are in place today, having led several of them, including the Central America Free Trade Agreement, a couple brawls over trade rules and WTO reforms. So let me give you some of that, uh, some of the dynamics. First, we had a 25 year old NAFTA agreement, the first and really largest of its kind in the world that had achieved many, not all, but many of its original goals, including quadrupling trade between these three partners, making products more affordable, integrating the economy so that our businesses could compete better uh, abroad because of this agreement. It was economically successful, yet politically very unpopular. We had a presidential candidate uh, who had vowed to renegotiate NAFTA, but this time one who meant it, and upon winning the White House, was determined to do so. And it wasn't just because it was a campaign promise. It was because, as we know, President Trump has held strongly, uh, strongly held views for decades that America had not been a winner in past trade agreements or in global institutions like the World Trade Organization and his view, it was American workers, blue collar workers, who had paid the price for this. There was a recognition among North American uh, political and trade leaders 
that NAFTA, despite its successes, was outdated. It needed to be modernized, and there was a recognition, certainly here in America, that there had been a global surge of bilateral and regional trade arrangements that often left America outside of it. Um, what we knew politically and what I had seen was that since NAFTA, with very few exceptions, um, within Congress, there had been a gradual and significant, and I mean dramatic, deterioration of bipartisan support in Congress for trade. Uh, there was growing uh, opposition within the Democratic Party, oftentimes leading to very sparse support for trade-related issues, um, and in some cases, political punishment for in primaries for Democrats who, in effect, crossed the line, trade line, uh, to join with what usually was pretty overwhelming Republican support to pass new agreements it, it, or trade rules. There was, in, in my view, at the moment of USMCA, strong opposition in the Democratic House to initiatives by President Trump, yet very strong support for continued trade with our largest trading partners, Canada uh, and Mexico. Part of the, I think, untold story here is what happened next among all those dynamics, not even mentioning steel and aluminum tariffs and other issues. But I think what surprised me uh, in looking back is that President Trump and his trade ambassador, Bob Lighthizer, made it very clear from the start, USMCA would be a bipartisan agreement and it would gain strong support by Democrats and Republicans. I think Don would agree that was met with a great deal of skepticism from all corners uh, here, um, including me. But the negotiating objectives that they set forth, forth immediately reinforced this approach, as well as extensive consultations that Ambassador Lighthizer held with what had been traditionally anti-trade uh, labor Democrats, as well as labor unions that have always been opposed to trade agreements. When the agreement came out in October of 2018, you know, it, it did a number of things, but it was clear it had given labor Democrats concessions in trade that they had long sought, but never achieved, even coming close to any of them with past administration, especially in the area of labor, uh, in dispute settlement and automotive rules that required higher wages in Mexico and higher U.S. and North America content uh, in these vehicles and parts. From there, Ambassador Lighthizer continued to meet and listen to Democrats and Republicans and labor unions uh, throughout uh, Congress. And I think, too, his background uh, as uh, in the Senate uh, with USTR as a steel labor attorney uh, gave him uh, really the skills to work with both parties. And I think it was crucial, the working group that Speaker Pelosi uh, created uh, that focused on enforcement processes, standards and funding, as well as leadership uh, by Democrats, such as uh, our chairman, Richie Neal, I think contributed to what turned out to be historically in somewhat shocking bipartisan vote uh, in Congress. There's no question the agreement itself is sound. It retains the successful foundations of NAFTA, including zero tariffs on all U.S. goods that we sell to Mexico and nearly all the products to Canada. It opened the Canadian market further for U.S. dairy, wine, and poultry, important ag. It locked in many, not all, but many of the key reforms in Mexico on energy and telecom, and it created a level playing field for financial services, investment. Uh, it established really the best digital trade rules of any trade agreement in existence today, So, which helps people in their online commerce, regardless of the size, or type of business. There's no question because it protected U.S. intellectual property, 
uh, tools to guard against counterfeiting and piracy. It's, it will spur U.S. innovation. I'll make this point too. The working relationship, excuse me, the business relationship between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada was very strong. And so a lot of questions were how much bigger would this agreement grow, uh, that relationship? The short answer is it will, and I think it will be significant over time. But I think the the benefits of this agreement were not in quantity, but in quality. This agreement set standards for really what a 21st century trade agreement ought to look like. Uh, it set standards to end discrimination in regulations. It removed technical barriers to trade, modernized the custom process so we could move legitimate goods across the border faster and more affordably. I think it was vitally important to the U.S. auto sector with a number of key changes there, a priority of the administration. I think of importance to Democrats and Republicans is this includes the strongest, most enforceable labor provisions in U.S. trade history. And I think this agreement requires Mexico to create a true union system, including rights that all workers uh, will be guaranteed, collective bargaining rights, secret and personal voting, the right to strike, and tools to protect American or Mexican union workers against violence. Um, in many ways, this was those those sections were, in effect, dream provisions for labor Democrats who had long worked to see this into our into trade agreements, and really, I think, has ended the predicament we had, which forced American workers to compete against artificially low Mexico wages. Final point, I think the entire agreement is fully enforceable. Um, unlike NAFTA, that means no, no, none of the countries can block the panels that can resolve disputes that ultimately occur. I also think because it created certainty where there was uncertainty within the trade and economic uh, um, community, I think this was an area where UMCA, USMCA will create further growth uh, in all three countries. And this is an area where ultimately Republicans, Democrats, President Trump's trade team worked together to find consensus. It was an all hands on deck effort, as Don will tell you, he was deeply involved in this. And I, and I am uh, immensely proud of that bipartisan support here. I've counted noses for a lot of trade agreements and rules over the years. And for me, uh, watching every member of the Texas delegation, House and Senate, vote yes for this agreement was something, frankly, I never thought I would see. So with that, um, again, Dr. Gans, thank you for having me. And, and I yield the floor to, to my friend, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I'm thrilled to be part of this. Once uh, my youngest is a Rice graduate, so when I heard it was sponsored by the Baker Institute and with Kevin Brady, it was an instant yes. So thank you for being part of this. And David, uh, Dr. Gantz, thank you for hosting us and moderating this. I totally agree with you on the importance of the Ways and Means Committee. As uh, Chairman Brady and Chairman Neal often point out, it's the only committee mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. Is the oldest committee, and, uh, and it's the one that we get to brag about most. Um, Dr. Gantz, too, you mentioned that I was in Switzerland. Um, one of the most res biggest responsibilities of representing your country overseas is trying to stimulate positive trade relations between that country and, and home. And I was very proud that tiny little Switzerland with 8 million people was the number one foreign direct investor in the United States in 2010. I wish I could actually take credit for it, but I was there when it happened. So, <laughs> it was fun. And I'm delighted to serve with uh, and to do this with Kevin Brady. Uh, I served with Kevin when you were the acting chairman or the chairman of the Joint Economic Committee and watched with, with envy as you chaired the, the Ways and Means Committee for a number of years. And it's also, you know, Kevin, you're such a good guy. And often we have different viewpoints when we have our hearings and our debates so it's, it's a thrill to be here to agree with almost everything you said <laughs> and, and uh, to, to reaffirm your notion that we have much more in common than, than that what divides us. Um, so thank you for being, being with us. I mean, the USMCA really does stand as one of the very few 
real bipartisan achievements in the last few years. And it was the product of two distinct negotiations, both of which at times looked closer to failure than success. The first negotiation, of course, was between the USTR, Ambassador Lighthizer, and his Canadian and Mexican counterparts. And uh, I wasn't part of those, and I'm sure in the seminars to come, we'll hear about them. But the second negotiation between House Democrats and Bob Lighthizer was no less critical to the success of the final product that went into force earlier this summer. You know, in November 2019, after the president had signed the original agreement, we knew that it had many positive elements, a lot of which were pulled from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but also from the perspective of House Democrats was fundamentally flawed. And there are also bipartisan concerns, largely around the dispute settlement mechanism, which is written because the panel blocking was fundamentally broken. That meant, whatever its merits, this was not an agreement that was going, going to go into legal force. And this was especially true, as Kevin suggested, when it had to face votes from House and Senate Democrats, who had become ever more suspect of trade agreements and their impact upon the American worker. Remember that uh, only 27 House Democrats voted for trade promotion authority for a Democratic president, Barack Obama. Um, and that very few, you can probably count them on one hand, of House Democrats that were enthusiastic about uh, the TPP as Mike Froman had presented it. I'm one of those very few, so I can say that. Um, so if I had to handicap the prospects of the agreement passing at that time, November 19, I, I'd have been pretty pessimistic. However, there were key elements that made the ultimate deal achievable, including a recognition across the aisle that after 25 years, NAFTA needed to be updated. And in fact, um, people on both sides and people in Ottawa and Mexico City were making public statements that underlined the difficulties, but also outlined the elements that would make a deal possible. And once the Canadian and Mexican governments fully understood the process that we had to go through in the United States and were willing to make the necessary changes, be part of those negotiations that it led to the Buenos Aires 2019 agreement, then we could go forward. Um, you know, in certain areas like the dispute resolution mechanism, our North American partners probably preferred the House position, but Mexico in particular was asked to and ultimately did make difficult political commitments. But second, the administration's negotiating structure was clear. Uh, Ambassador Lighthizer was motivated and ultimately empowered to make a deal on behalf of the president. We see in the current impasse over the sorely needed COVID assistance package that I'm sure has Chairman Brady and I worried every night, uh, how difficult it is when there are too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, you'll excuse the torture and mixed metaphor, but that really conveys the mess of the situation. I really believe that if Secretary Mnuchin and Nancy Pelosi alone were doing this. We would have had a deal already, as we've already had four major deals that they negotiated. But we're still hoping and praying they'll get one soon. And then despite what people said and thought throughout the negotiations, Speaker Pelosi was actually committed to a workable agreement. She kept saying in all the public and private meetings, we want to get to yes, something that could pass the House and then the destructive uncertainty hanging over the American economy. So she created a very unorthodox negotiating process that ultimately ensured the final agreement had the necessary buy-in from House Democrats and Senate Democrats that ensured, as, as Kevin suggested, a, a remarkably strong majority in both houses. And the working group structure that served, it was supported by the staff, the Ways and Means, and the Speaker's Office, as the House counterpart to the USTR wasn't always popular within our party. Uh, for example, people to serve on the trade subcommittee like me that were left off of it. <laughs> there are many of us. Um, and it grew a lot of criticism from people off the Hill who thought that the membership of the working group signaled a hardline approach unlikely to get to yes. For example, Rosa DeLaro, who led the fight against trade promotion authority, was on that working group. Um, Jan Schakowsky, not a fan of trade agreements, was on that working group. But the final product from both a substantive and political perspective, actually made the wisdom of that structure pretty clear. And we were accused almost weekly of stalling or burying the agreement out of personal animus to the president. But when we finally got to the agreement, that gave lie to that theory. The House Democrats are ready to do the work and provide the votes 
as long as the administration recognized that political professor or pressure couldn't substitute for, for substantive reform. So the reforms, Kevin's mentioned many of the good things that are in that bill, including language that allowed party to block the formation of dispute settlement panel, which had bedeviled the original NAFTA agreement. And for the first time ever, a trade agreement created rules of evidence that will help U.S. litigate fact-intensive disputes. And of course, the most difficult and ideally most consequential part was a labor enforcement mechanism. Chairman Brady talked about um, the, the dilemma with developing meaningful trade unions, labor unions in Mexico. Um, but the, uh, this agreement was able to, to set the structure, including in Mexican law and in the Mexican budget, to actually move forward on that. It's perhaps underappreciated how novel and important and progressive it is to have an agreement that actually holds participating companies accountable for bad co behaviors. Companies, not just countries. It's a little like putting ISDS on its head. With ISDS, companies had special rights of action to sue countries that no one else had. But here we start to rebalance the dynamics by making companies, who are arguably the greatest beneficiaries of FDAs, also accountable. And speaking of ISDS, part of what's remarkable about this agreement is what it doesn't contain. So I know it was tough for some of my Republican friends to swallow the restrictions on the ESDS and the elim elimination of the biologics provisions that industry demanded so vociferously, but that's also what helped to doom the TPP. So on the democratic side, despite significant advances on environmental enforcement, there still remains significant heartburn over our inability to secure, secure provisions about climate change. In fact, I would say most of the no votes from Democrats in the House and Senate were because the new NAFTA USMCA doesn't address climate change at all. And of course, our response was that wasn't what it was intended to do. Uh, that wasn't part of the original NAFTA. Um, but the debate will go on in Congress about how we enforce it. It comes up every day. I one of the things I'm thrilled about is the environmental packages. I stood with uh, Chairman Blumenauer, Earl Blumenauer, at the wastewater treatment above the Tijuana River and watched horrified as untreated human waste was dumped right into the Pacific Ocean only to flow north to San Diego. And part of what was secured in the implementing bill, I think it was $315 million just to address uh, that cross-border wastewater in, into the Pacific. This isn't an easy process or, or perfect one, but it does represent a remarkable achievement given the context in which it occurred. It's my hope that the passage of this agreement with a strong bipartisan vote would have put an end to the cycle of threat and uncertainty that has governed the trading relationship between these closest neighbors. And it's critical that this agreement provides the promised economic certainty. I confess I'm disappointed by the recent announcement of tariffs on Canadian aluminum, followed by the hard on the entry of force into the agreement. And I certainly hope that we minimize the adversarial stances between our countries. But I also suspect that that posture, like much else that will be decided in November, whether it's President Trump or Vice President Biden or Kanye West, that bipartisan commitment to its proper implementation and look forward to the congressional role in that process. As a humble undergraduate, I studied a lot of development economics and I learned that a country cannot grow from within. Trade is essential. And the post-liberal war, World War II liberalization of international trade has resulted in unprecedented reductions in hunger, poverty, dictatorial political systems, and huge increases in health and life expectancy. So this new USMCA as negotiated by Ambassador Lighthizer and improved by his substantive discussions with the House Working Group, I believe has created the new archetype by which all future US trade agreements must be measured. And it's my fervent hope that this agreement will presage a new renewed bipartisan commitment to trade. And I look forward to working with Chairman Brady on this and his other 13 trade agreements in the years to come. <laughs> and with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you both, members of Congress, for your very illuminating remarks. And again, uh, my congratulations for this remarkable bipartisan achievement. Um, I was off for a couple of minutes due to my uh, Comcat, Comcast internet going down, but it seems to be back up for the moment, so I apologize for being away for a little while. Um, I'd like to talk about a couple of things which I think both of you have touched on, but pursuing them a little further, particularly uh, 
Congressman Byers last comment. To what extent do both of you think the USMCA or at least significant parts of the USMCA can be a model for future trade agreements? Uh, the current administration is be has begun negotiations with Kenya in Africa and with the United Kingdom, which is in the process of withdrawing from the European Union. Some other countries have been mentioned from time to time. So how do you see this as working? Let's suppose that whoever's elected in November, discussions go forward with the UK. I think that's pretty likely. Uh, and either with Kenya or maybe with the, uh, uh, that new Pan-African Customs Union. Uh, what about those? What about others? Uh, is, is there something that we have all learned besides the bipartisan cooperation um, that would make moving forward on those agree on future agreements easier? Uh, I'll start with Kevin Brady. So the short answer is I think there are a number of the standards set in USMCA that are really the gold standard globally. I think the digital services side of this would, uh, glo digital trade would be one area, the service sector, um, 21st century agreements uh, have to do two things, not just focus on goods, but on services, which are America's, we are very good at this in our export. It makes up a large part of our local economy and past agreements have often overlooked them. I think that uh, the other 21st century uh, real world challenge is that barriers are to trade are pretty sophisticated. Uh, they're just not done at the border with tariffs and quotas. But beyond that, and oftentimes we see in regions and countries sort of barriers you don't, that, that aren't always clear. And for American businesses, it can be like plugging, a, putting American plug into a European socket. Uh, it's designed not to be able to merge and match. These trade agreements go beyond the borders into removing those uh, barriers. USMCA, I think, um, set some real standards in tearing those barriers down. Regulatory, uh, facilitation, uh, fairness, uh, small business, a number of those issues I think are very key. The labor environmental provisions have always been hot points, I think, flashpoints in trade. I think that will, how this model goes forward, depends on the country we're negotiating or region we're negotiating with. Each of them faces different challenges. And as we've discovered, uh, labor, environment, services, ag uh, can play very different roles depending on whether you're dealing with a Kenya or a UK, uh, whether you're reaching out into Latin America, whether you're strengthening the trade partnership in Europe. And so the short answer is, I think a number of these provisions have set the standards. Some of them will also be models and I think terrific starting points for discussions with other agreements. I'm, I like Don, you know, I agree. It's, it's not enough to buy American. We have to sell American all throughout the world. We've, we have a lot of barriers and America need not apply signs up around this uh, world and trade agreements that are free and fair, that are 21st century models, can help us sell more around the world. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Beyer? Well, I agree with everything that, that Chairman Brady has just said, um, and, including the fact that we need to sell a lot more. I think one of the statistics I remember from my time overseas was that only 2% of American businesses actually export. Um, and it's a relatively small part of our GDP. As opposed, again, I, I, I speak of the things I know in, in Switzerland had seven times the export volume per, per person that we did. Uh, obviously, they're a little country and they have to, but um, it would be good for us to grow that piece of it. Um, I, and Kevin, I, I reluctant, was reluctant to use the phrase gold standard because I don't want to move back to the gold standard. <laughs> so I used archetype or benchmark <laughs> instead. Um, but yes, I totally agree. I think what the USMCA has done is show that Democrats who have been very trade reluctant and skeptical for, for a couple of decades now can come back to the table and support them 
as long as they know that there are strong environmental considerations and strong labor considerations. And I think that's a real win for everybody. We want the people in Vietnam. In fact, when I was, my strong support for TPP was about lifting the labor standards in all those uh, Asian Pacific countries. Uh, that was definitely necessary. And you think about the environmental challenges. One of the things we didn't mention were the, the multilateral environment agreements, the MEAs that are included in USMCA, endangered species, marine pollution, wetlands, regulation of whaling, et cetera. Um, all these things can be included in future agreements, whether it's Kenya or the UK or whomever. And I think that's going to be good for the world. One of the small differences that I think many Democrats have with Ambassador Lighthizer is a strong emphasis on bilateral trade agreements. Uh, nothing wrong with bilateral. Um, and I know he's very skeptical of uh, the, the multi multilateral. But there's a middle ground there where you can do four or five the plurilateral trade agreements. Um, because with 190 or 210 countries, everywhere there are right now, to go the bilateral way is going to take us a long, long time. Thank you. you. Thank you both very much. Um, uh, it, it, again, it's a, uh, I guess, a related question is uh, what other candidates are out there? I've heard Taiwan mentioned. I've it's obviously very complicated politically. I've heard Vietnam mentioned. Congressman Beyer, you just mentioned Vietnam. Uh, I think there's some in the administration who have also talked about an agreement with Vietnam, partly because there's a huge trade deficit. Have you thought at all about that one, Congressman Byer? Well, I would still love us to re-enter TPP. It became the TPP-11. They left a space for us. Um, obviously, it's probably not going to be the exact same TPP that was negotiated in the Obama administration. And I'm not sure. I think maybe even President Trump, if he's reelected, will be more open to that if it looks more like USMCA than the TPP of President Obama's. Um, but failing that, as many of the bilaterals or plurilaterals we can do with a subset of that. I know this administration has worked very hard with mixed success on, on the China trade stuff. Um, I, don't, I'm not, I can't offer any simple solution because it's incredibly complicated. But I do think the more we can build a uh, a group of countries around China that work together with us, the Vietnams, Malaysias, Japans, Koreas, Australias, um, the stronger negotiating group position we're going to have with President Xi and the Chinese. Congressman Brady? Yeah, so no, I think that makes great uh, remarks there and points. I think one thing in context is if you look what this administration is focused on, whether it's renegotiating NAFTA, which had been promised in future administrations but not followed through on, uh, continued discussions with Europe, with UK, the phase one agreement with Japan and the phase one agreement with China, you know, they, they targeted where the, the sales and markets are. Those regions uh, that the administration is focused on Price probably three fourths of all our exports around the world. It is, I think, the top priority in trade is to close out those agreements, whether they're with the UK. I hope the EU can begin to get serious about ag and some issues there uh, for Europe, a second uh, for a broader agreement with Japan. And I think that the second uh, phase of the China agreement, which I think Frankly, I was stunned in a pleasant way by phase one and uh, barring COVID had had believed we would see a phase two by the end of the year. Nonetheless, while we look at more bilaterals, as Don pointed out, in areas where we, we clearly have a U.S. interest in engaging, such as in Africa, really important. Um, I think the top priority for any uh, executive uh, in the White House should be, you know, finishing out a super ambitious trade agenda uh, already, frankly, in the works. Thank you very much. Um, let me move now um, to a couple of questions from our, um, uh, our audience. Uh, one of them, which I'm doing some paraphrasing, has to do with what I think both of you mentioned at least briefly before, but maybe you can elaborate on it. Um, how are the uh, these 
labor provisions going to be effectively enforced uh, by Mexico, by the US administration, and more precisely, uh, what role, if any, do you see for Ways and Means Committee going forward in helping this process work the way everybody wants, wants to? I mean, this is one of these areas where you had bipartisan support. Uh, some Republicans thought it would help to raise wages in Mexico, which many of us think is a great idea. Others were simply worried about um, uh, a situation where uh, for many, many years, independent unions have essentially been barred. So any further gloss on that? I think one of the key enforcement issues under the agreement would be appreciated. Uh, Congressman Beyer. Yeah, th thanks, Dr. Gantz. I'm actually pretty optimistic about it. Um, among other things, there's a, an independent Mexico Labor Experts Board that's created by the legislation. Um, there there with 12 different members. There'll be an interagency committee on labor among the U.S. agencies. And we're sending uh, a number, I don't know whether it's three, four, five, labor attaches to Mexico City to watch over this. And obviously, we've, we've been putting a lot of pressure on Mexico to make sure that they were not only passing the laws that would, that would allow independent, um, democratically elected labor unions to form, um, as opposed to the ones that are formed by the companies before the workers are even hired, um, and that they're properly funded, that the Mexico has the people on board to do that. Um, so we will be watching that really closely and continuing to um, work, I think, with a lot of pressure on our Mexican folks, because it's not going to be easy to have this really remarkable culture change there among their workers. Um, we want them to be much closer to where uh, we would like labor to be uh, in the United States. And, but I think that the many pieces are in place to do that. Thank you. Congressman Brady. Microphone, please. I'm not hearing you. There you go. It took a minute there. Perfect. Sir. Yeah, I have the same problem. Sir, sorry about that. So I think um, when the, the the changes in Mexico's law on labor, in my view, are transformational. And when Congressman Henry Cuellar from Texas and I visited uh, Mexico during the negotiations, I was struck by the desire by uh, Mexico's leaders to, to transform the, their labor environment. As one of their uh, uh, ministers uh, told me, you know, our, Mexico's economic future uh, doesn't lie in low wages. We've tried that. Our economic future lies in productivity, in competitiveness, in innovation. And I think this, uh, what was important about USMCA is that it, it reinforced, you know, and supported those types of changes. Secondly, there are a number of enforcement mechanisms here that I think are key. In the negotiation, um, with the working group and Ambassador Lighthizer. In a sense, that wasn't a negotiation between Democrats and the White House. It was almost a negotiation between Congress, uh, the White House, and Mexico, because we were drilling deeper in the enforcement mechanisms to make sure that Mexico and Canada uh, was held accountable. It was working together to make those changes real. I think that will be, uh, and while those, in my view, you know, we did delay far too long on this agreement. Uh, I believe 99% of that agreement stayed in place, but that 1% at the end, I think mattered in the sense that it really uh, created a process for labor Democrats to drill down even some of those who, who weren't going to support it. I think it was an opportunity for Ambassador Lighthizer, the White House, to really drill down deeper with Mexico on specifics, timetables, funding, and all that. And so I think from, from my view, again, working on a number of these agreements, you know, I think the, the labor provisions matter in, in, in a big way in the enforcement, which Republicans, Democrats, both support matter. Final point, I think, is, as you mentioned earlier, no trade agreement is agreeable to all. There are 
uh, areas of this that frankly I strongly disagree with on investor state uh, uh, resolution on not protecting uh, American investment in new medicines. Nonetheless, and I think Don probably could provide a list as well. Nonetheless, this agreement found a way to bridge that gap. And I, I really I commend every player in this for finding a way to do this. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, I have a question from uh, someone who says essentially with the onset of e-commerce and uh, among other provisions, as you know, in uh, uh, USMCA, it makes it much easier for American suppliers of goods like Amazon to send small packages back and forth to both to Canada and Mexico, which up to now have had ridiculously uh, low thresholds for uh, such uh, transactions. But with, with e-commerce coming in, there's a problem which obviously is not limited to North America. And that is, uh, if Americans are buying pharmaceutical products and food products, and such, uh, sometimes by by e-commerce now, rather than just from the supermarkets. How how do you assure that the um, regulatory agencies in the U.S., the Department of Agriculture, uh, and others, and their and their uh, counterparts in Mexico uh, and um, the uh, the uh, Canada are going to be able to police some of this expansion in commerce and protect not only our own citizens, but those in Mexico and Canada, in, particularly with food products. Congressman Beyer. That sounds like something Congressman Brady should answer. Okay, let him start. <laughs> no. oh, if, if it were autos, Don Beyer would know what. <laughs> Clearly, that may be the next question. <laughs> let me just say that. So um, you mentioned it, and, and it's not really uh, a phrase most American use, but uses most Americans, but the de minimis rules simply mean, you know, at what value of a of a of a product, you know, moving across our lines, you know, uh, have duties attached to it, and in ours uh, in the U.S. is very high. Mexico and Canada were unacceptably low. Uh, Ambassador Lighthizer gained uh, some space there, uh, certainly not as much as he or or others uh, would like. I don't believe uh, those thresholds contribute to less secure, less security, uh, whether it's in, um, especially in the types of products that are uh, uh, brought across um, national lines. I think there has been bipartisan, terrific bipartisan work, both in stopping, you know, shipments of fentanyl uh, from China and other countries. I think there's been a concerted effort on transshipments within the U.S., Mexico and Canada, uh, our Customs and Border Patrol 2015, we, we redesigned that agency to focus on the security and the speed with which goods travel across our country. And we've seen significant reforms in that area that move uh, goods both quicker, but with more security as you do that. It isn't an issue that goes away, I'll finish with this. You know, every country is very aware of e-commerce uh, and its upside, which is just dramatic. And the USMCA really, again, sets that standard for that modern 21st economy, 21st century economy. We also know that we have to be even more vigilant, you know, on the avenues for illegitimate trade uh, of those goods crossing borders. And I think that will continue to be a priority. Thank you. That's uh, oh, very just, Please oh, go ahead. On with with Kevin's comments on de minimis. That is a part of the agreement that both Canada and Mexico will raise their de minimis standards, which absolutely makes sense, especially as we're seeing in this COVID-19 world where so much of stuff is being shipped to our home as we, as we abandon the retail store for the short run. Um, but then to the larger issue of what's in these packages, and we've been struggling for a number of years with medications coming out of China in particular that don't include what they're supposed to. So this, this is part of a much larger effort that precedes USMCA and, and by the FDA and the FTC and many other regulatory agencies to figure out how to protect Americans from things that come through the mail rather than picked up off the shelf. And uh, there's to be no substitute really for lots of reporting by individual consumers to the relevant government agencies. Thank you very much. Um, if I could, I will modify a question, but the question essentially says, 
how in administrations, we can talk about the Obama administration, we can talk about the Trump administration, we can talk about the future, uh, how does the president's views translate into an agreement? In this particular case, Mr. Lighthizer and the president work together very well. Um, perhaps it's worth talking about how the TP, uh, TTP worked out. What's the relationship there and what makes it work? Keeping in mind that under the TPA, the uh, members of the committee are should be deeply involved in the process. I guess, Representative Brady, you can start. Sure, I'll jump in here. So one, Congress holds authority uh, and constitutional power over approving trade agreements. We delegate uh, to the administration uh, um, the ability to negotiate them based on our objectives and our goals. We require uh, considerable consultation throughout that process, and then we Congress holds the ultimate power, which is to vote in agreement up or down. Uh, I think that's important. Secondly, uh, any smart administration is going to listen to Congress, Republicans and Democrats in negotiating and shaping that agreement. Not that you get everything you want. You, you don't as a country, uh, frankly, or as individuals uh, necessarily. That's key. The other thing, too, you know, trade policy is is set. Um, and really um, implemented by the administration, who is president matters. USMCA, there's no question, reflects the priorities of this president to see that blue collar working class man and woman get a better deal. Uh, you're, you see that throughout this agreement. Final point, and you sort of asked this in your last question as well, and Don and I referenced it, but Ways and Means Committee plays a key role. What we know is once an agreement is uh, uh, approved by Congress, the hard work begins. There is a tremendous amount of work to be done before an agreement enters into force. I think the White House was right to push for a July 1st entry into force. It really required everyone to dramatically engage through industry, government, the three countries to move forward. We have a lot more work to do, and the role of Ways and Means here uh, will be in monitoring the implementation uh, taking the viewpoints of our businesses and stakeholders at home into this implementation process, the oversight of issues like enforcement that Don talked about uh, on these provisions, all of that in the House at least rests with the Ways and Means Committee. And that implementation is equally as important as the negotiation of the agreement itself. You have to make sure that agreement follows what we reach consensus on. And so big role for Ways and Means members. And again, we're forcing to have uh, leaders like Don with his background as we go into, as we move into this phase. It's, it's fun to hear the former chairman of Ways and Means and long time uh, pointing out just how important the Ways and Means Committee is. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. And, and, and Dr. Gans, to your question, obviously, uh, whoever is president has an enormous impact on what happens in our legislation, in our culture, and in our trade agreements. I think we're lucky that, I was just reviewing, I think every president in our lifetimes has been pro-trade and has recognized that America can best grow if we are able to fairly tear down tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers and, and move forward. Um, one of the things that I'm not sure Kevin's as much concerned about as I am, maybe was more concerned when when Obama was president and I now as Trump is president, is uh, the concentration of power in the presidency, which has been moving very much in that direction and away from Congress. Um, I'm not quite sure how we reverse that, but um, as a member of Congress, I love to see a, a better balance of power. In the meantime, I don't think that's affecting the trade agreements very much. Thank you very much. Okay, one more question, at least maybe two. Um, let me combine a, a couple of them. Uh, there are a couple of obviously enormous challenges that businesses, particularly in the US, but all over North America are facing today. One of course is COVID-19. Uh, and one of course is the trade war with China, which has raised uh, prices for a lot of goods coming from China for a lot of businesses. Um, there are some who feel that between COVID-19 and the trade war and some of the national security issues, this is a great time for uh, better 
uh, investment in North America, not just in the U.S., which is obviously the administration's preference, but also in um, in Mexico. For example, to take the automobile example, the uh, domestic content requirements under USMCA go six, from 62.5% to 75% over three years. Uh, most of that uh, difference will come presumably out of Asia and other chi and Chinese uh, production, and some of it may benefit Mexico. How do you see this uh, affecting things, uh, Congress and Bayer? I think basically in a positive way. I know we've already had a number of, of roundtables and hearings on reviving the supply chain to the United States in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis that we, I think, discovered that for PPE and many other things, we may have been far too dependent on, for example, China. Um, so to the extent that we can rethink U.S. manufacturing with a greater emphasis on building it here and buying it here, I think that's good for all America. Thank you. Congressman Brady. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a real opportunity here for North America. One of the cruel lessons of COVID-19 has been America learning that we are vulnerable to bad actors like China on crucial medicines, medical supplies, uh, ingredients, as well as technology. Um, it is a lesson uh, that we need to learn from. Ways and Means Republicans have introduced a package of bills here within the last month uh, on behalf of House Republicans to make America more medically independent from China. It includes very aggressive incentives to um, anchor, not contain, but anchor reliable, resilient production of those crucial medicines. For example, the ones we can't stockpile, the ones we need, need for defense, those key uh, PPE elements that frankly, uh, we need to have uh, stockpiled and ready to go. Uh, I think it's those production lines and supply chains uh, should run through reliable trading partners like Mexico and Canada. And I think it is a real opportunity both for medical security, but to, to, to frankly bring the strengths of our three countries together again for everyone's benefit. To, to okay. just pile on David to, sure. to, to the wonderful comments that, that Kevin just made. I think I go back to a paper that David Petraeus and Joe Nye wrote a couple of years ago that if the 20th century was the American century, the 21st century could easily be the North American century. And you put the power of Canada and Mexico together with the United States and we, we beat everybody. I think that's a, a very good point. I, I, want, I note that the uh, President Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau a few uh, months ago said, North America ought to be developing 5G as a group rather than having to rely on other countries in Europe or, or, um, or in uh, in China. Um, I don't know how much time we have. I think it's only a couple of minutes, but I'll ask one quick question. Uh, one of our listeners says, why are we calling it CUSMA and TMEC in Canada and Mexico and USMZ here? Does that bother any of us? Anybody want to make a point? <laughs> Short answer is no. You know, call it what it is in each country. I think that works uh, just fine. And, and uh, you know, a, ho a home country ought to lead, you know, uh, with this agreement. I think that the key, you know, it doesn't come trippingly off your tongue. There's no question about it, but I think the, the benefits are real. And I think that's what matters. Okay. A rose is a rose is a rose. Yeah. And I would, I would point out that the, uh, in Mexico, NAFTA was T-L-C-A-N, Tratado Libre de Neabarca del Norte. I suppose if this had been NAFTA too, nobody would have complained about it. But in any event, uh, doesn't seem to be causing a lot of problems compared to some of the other challenges we have. I believe we have to quit soon. Laura, is that right? Do I have more time? Go. We have more time? Yeah. My wife okay. says we have to go. <laughs> Your wife says you have to go. <laughs> Laura is the end all and be all of this um, of this arrangement. No, no, no. Uh, I... She's behind you. Uh, so uh, maybe we will go ahead and uh, and cut, cut short at this point, uh, since I've exhausted, I think, the audience's questions and most of my own, and uh, our esteemed members uh, of Congress have added a lot of uh, uh, very useful 
uh, context just as I had hoped. So once again, I congratulate both of you in being uh, instrumental in getting this historic deal for North America through. And thank you again for appearing today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Chairman. Yeah, thank thank you. you, Don.